Hello, everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and the producer of the chats with Mistress Joanne Gaddy. The fireside chats are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Now, today, I have the privilege of an interview with Glenn Rossiter, who is in New Zealand. Glenn, in what town are you located? Uh, 45 minutes drive out of Christchurch, which is one of the four larger cities in, in New Zealand, um, and a little little township called Little River. Little River, New Zealand. Okay. Right. Now, Glenn Rossiter is the founder, the organizer, producer, all-around caretaker of an organization called the Christchurch Fetish Ball. That's right. And Glenn, you've been doing this how many years? Uh, I'll be going on 21. Okay, about 21 years. That's pretty good. Before we explore that in depth, though, I want to take a quick step back. Tell me a little bit about your growing up and your family and your life in New Zealand. Um, standard family, um, uh, standard house on the outskirts of the city, um, went to a standard school, uh, left school, went to a standard job. Um, I don't know. What, what depth would you like me to go into? Were you even aware of the fetish community, the fetish scene when you were growing up? No, no. Um, I had reasonably boring jobs for quite a, quite a long time. Um, and then um, it would have been mid-80s, I guess. Um, got a job with my, um, my partner at the time. Uh, father was a... Uh, um, a, a maintenance technician at the Christchurch Polytechnic and um, he got me a job uh, working at a, a company over the road from the Polytech which um, did all sorts of meta work um, left there to go work at the Polytech, the Polytech itself as a maintenance technician um, which my uh, ex-father-in-law uh, got me a job as well um, but while while I was there, um, there, there was a student radio station, um, which I thought would be quite cool to, um, to secure myself a spot on and play some of the music that I was uh, fond of at the time, which was uh, punk rock. Um, so I, um, I managed to get a, uh, a two-hour slot on a Sunday night, um, called it the Punk and Hardcore Show, <clears throat> and we would, um, my friends and I would. I uh, get on the air and um, and do what we wanted for two hours, um, seven till nine. So, how did you conceive of the uh, fetish ball? Um, it probably follows on from having that show actually, because um, the, the program manager, the uh, the boss at the radio station, thought it would be a good idea if we could get a, a sponsor on board. One to help cover <clears throat> some of the um, uh, very minor costs involved, and two just to get other people in the, in the city involved and up the presence, uh, that, that kind of thing. So um, I approached um, uh, a retail clothing store in, in Christchurch um, that had just popped up um, called Hunters and Collectors here, which uh, turned out to be um, a very successful um, enterprise for him over, over the years. He's only just in the last six or eight months or so, um, finally close the doors on the store for good. Hunters collectors would uh, buy and sell second-hand goods like um, uh, footwear, clothing, leather jackets, um, uh, jewellery, more alternative, like you, you, the, the rockers and the, and the metlers and the, uh, would be in there buying the leathers and studs and, um, and all, the, uh, all the trinkets and things that go with it. So um, Jason and I you know, hit it off immediately and um, I ended up eight years later leaving Christchurch Polytech and going working for him. So um, with going into retail, um, quite different from the previous path I'd taken, which was, I guess, engineering and uh, maintenance. So um, it was uh, there was another nice um, change in life. Uh, Hanging out with the, um, the alternative crowd, and um, um, so that kind of uh, that helped me um, get in the door with um, with 
not following on from playing punk rock on the radio, but following on with um, playing music that appealed to people um, to a wider audience and myself in the bedroom. How did you take that and apply it to the uh, creation of the fetish ball? With Christchurch having a really good nightlife at that time, there were new clubs and bars popping up everywhere all the time while others went under for whatever reason or reopened with a facelift. Um, uh, there was a um, a nightclub opened not far from the shop where I worked um, called the Liquor Lounge, and the liquor was spelt uh, L-I-C-K-E-R, and was owned by a couple of people who were um, popular in the underground uh, nightlife scene and were very well known for their um, uh, sociable and sometimes outrageous um, um, events and things. Um, they they put on an event, must have been in the late 90s, um, and it was called the Libido Ball. Um, it was um, invite only. Um, it was a, a themed event, um, costume essential kind of thing. Um, they had uh, live acts performances, uh, um, and it was a hell of a night. It was <laughs> fantastic. And I thought, this is great. Uh, um, an underground club uh, that everyone wants to get into and, and uh, with these edgy um, I mean looking back it, it wasn't it, they weren't pushing many boundaries uh, with the um, types of uh, performances they had but um, there's potential you know what I mean um, <clears throat> and uh, in time went by and they decided to do another one um, and they called it Kinky Disco this time and it was a similar sort of thing um, I didn't enforce the dress up code so much because this this might have been close to a year later. And uh, bars and clubs, I don't know if it's everywhere, but in Christchurch particularly, seem to have a finite um, period of um, popularity. Whether they were starting to worry on on that front that they were starting to lose the crowd, or but um, they they let a few people in and kind of ruined the vibe. Uh, was not having such a high standard of, of dress. Um, and then they tried again, um, and it did not work. The, uh, half the crowd were not dressed up. The, the, um, the ratio of the people that should have been there and the people that should not have uh, even been allowed in the door was way wrong. And uh, and it was the last time they tried. And then um, about that time, I was getting quite a few gigs in, in bars and clubs playing dance music, <clears throat> and I had, a, <clears throat> I had a couple of residencies um, at uh, a couple of bars in the, in the city, and um, one of them had an upstairs bar, which um, held, oh, I guess, 150 people or so, and um, the, the, uh, the bar manager there decided to do an event similar to what the liquor lounge had put on, and co- copulation, they called that one, and um, similar thing. First one was great, second one not so good, third one flopped. So at that point I thought um, this needs to be done right. And uh, with me being a, a stickler for um, for things that I know that if they're going to work, then they'll keep working if you uphold standard. Um, I created the fetish ball and um, hired out the nightclub that um, was now in the space that used to be the liquor lounge new owners, knew everything, um, and used that as the first venue. It held 150 people. I got 120 through the door. Um, great night. Everyone had a blast. Um, and uh, about nine months later, I guess I did another one. Um, there was a queue outside the door at 11, and uh, so that, that filled up pretty quickly. People had, There were people in the queue that... Um, were trying to get in, knowing they wouldn't because they weren't dressed up, and, and you turn them away, and they kind of understood. But then there were people that knew me because I was busy in town and everyone knew me. Um, and they were, oh, come on, Glenn, yeah, can you let me in? You know, I, oh, sorry, bro, you're not dressed up. What, um, were you, what were you looking for as far as dress up? Oh, an effort. You know, no street clothes. Okay. So, yeah, yeah. So you know, it's not it's not a normal club night. You don't turn up in your normal club outfit. It's uh, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Accessorize. If someone can't bring themselves to um, 
you know, to <clears throat> improvise or or even hire something that looks mildly different, um, improvise with some um, with some accessories, you know, but people didn't quite get it and, and they were thinking that because they're my friend that I'd let them in and I'm like, sorry, you know, come back next time. And, uh, if, and from that day, I just uphold a standard, tried to. Um, inevitably, there are one or two that slip through. I don't know how, but um, it's got to be. Was this uh, a dress code that was published previous to entry yep. so people knew what to expect? Yes. And was it simply, <clears throat> you know, uh, yeah. for example, could someone have turned up in a clown outfit? Um, a clown outfit if they had the right attitude and the right um, means of bringing that clown um, into a kinky environment and making them fit in. And what would those have been? Uh, a naughty streak. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a really hard to define something that has such a broad um, there's no, there's no, there's no line in the sand. You can't say you're good and you're not, because the one that's not will always argue. But I've done this and he didn't do that, uh, so it's it's a really hard one. I mean, if I could impose an attitude code, then that would probably be easier. Um, but it's, it's uh, again, it's another hard one to police. Let's take one step back. Why fetish? Why that? As opposed to anything else oh i had a ring to it i think um and probably at that time nothing more than that um uh it was i mean i, I mulled over a few different um titles and um oh, i just sounded uh, it ran off the end of the tongue nicely it had a, a, a an edgy um slightly naughty um uh, a ring to it and um but it, it was something that people could possibly relate to if they allowed their um inhibitions to um to 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 let them um try something different how did you market to people who might have been shy about this kind of thing or concerned about being in public in their kink in the early days, it wasn't so much the uh, the underground fetishistas that um, I was uh, appealing to, or that were even taking notice. It was more the the central city clubbers that um, wanted to um, get their gimp on for the night and, and have a bit of uh, have a bit of fun doing something different. Um, so. I didn't really start off um, looking to attract the, the, the fetish crowd because the, there is no real, um, there's no cohesive group in Christchurch or uh, that I know of anywhere in New Zealand that um, get together regularly. Yeah, that, that makes me wonder then, in, in a rather small country... <laughs> Are people closeted more with any kind of fetish that they may enjoy? Never used to be, but I'll talk to you that. I guess the ball, as it gained in popularity, um, people that weren't in the Central City nightclub um, scene started to notice or hear about it. Um, I was getting some quite good press from um, the, the local mainstream newspaper writers that did columns on the central city nightlife the bar life and things like that so that they they would after the ball in the early days afterwards they would generally have a wee write up in, in the in the paper um about the event that um had just happened uh so i guess there are a few people that uh, hadn't even heard of the fetish ball that they read something that has just been on. They're like, "Oh, next year," you know. So it was a it was a building it slowly rather than launching into um, trying to appeal to everyone um, and trying to get them to drop their inhibitions uh, immediately and turn up in in, in fetish gear and stand in, in a queue on the side of a busy um, central city street waiting to get in. You know, um, but that did happen. You know. 
the first the first event, 120 people. Then went up to about 150. The next one, the next year about 180. And every year I, I chose a new venue. So it was always um, at that time there were you know there. I'd, I'd have maybe three or four different venues to choose from that would that would be happy to host the ball because not every venue, of course, was. Um, although that changed as well over time. Um, so it, it, yeah, it, grew, it grew over time. Um, it evolved. Do people travel from other parts of the country? Oh, people have traveled from around the world. The festival. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, the performers that I've had um, have been a, a major part of that. Um, like, uh, I, I'd only used local performers for the first two, mm. three years. Um, and then once I knew that I was guaranteed to get the numbers that I needed to cover my budget, then I started looking further afield, which... Um, I mean, the first point of call was um, the Sydney Health Eye Club, uh, yes. Jackie and Craig and, and co. So flew four of them over for, um, for a night of shenanigans, and they were fantastic. Yes, Jackie and I spoke previous to me doing this interview with you. Right. She mentioned how much she enjoyed uh, attending the Fetish Bowl, and she mentioned a scene that sticks with her very, very strongly. Okay. A suspension scene oh, with yeah. people from a, I guess, from one of the local tattoo shops or something. Tell us about that. Why was that so profound? Um, I mean, I've always tried to push the boundaries of not just what's legal and what's not uh, in public, but what is um, appropriate. And I've always, um, in that, trying to push boundaries, uh, I don't mind pushing too far and having some people go. That's not my. That's not. That's not me. You know. So um, that's the kind of um, response I want sometimes uh, is to um, is to just bring people out of their shell sometimes in a shocking way. But um, we've had flea shock suspensions, um, uh, all sorts of piercings, peggings, um, spankings, floggings, um, ev everything I guess involved in, in the BDSM side of things, but also. Um, I mean, you know, I could I could reel off a dozen or so performers that have flown in from uh, all corners of the globe. Um, uh, Mark Mark and Fly Girl from Australia as well. They um, they do shibari, rope suspension, uh, that sort of thing. Um, they're very dynamic on stage, which is uh, brilliant. They uh, the first time I flew them over, um, they just the crowd just went, "Wow, this is amazing." Um, uh, Lucas and Satomi, Lucas Vera from France, and Satomi, who's a, an American-born um, French girl who grew spent most of her life and uh, grew, grew up in Japan. So she is a um, she is a very highly trained um, kenbaku and shibari um, teacher and educator uh, and um, and performer um, along the lines of <coughs> Midori. Um, I've had Midori over um, and Kumi, Kumi Monta, um, um, Bridget Harrington or Lee Harrington as um, uh, he's referred to now, um, Sarah Sloan. Um, oh, I'd, I'd have to have a look back through some of the people that I've flown over. Where's been the furthest that someone's come? I think it probably would have been Lucas and Satomi flying them from France. Oh. One night was probably, um, I'd say, the, the furthest uh, that I've had someone. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I, I don't question everyone that arrives as to where they've come from, so um, I couldn't say, but you know, a regular contingent from the North Island um, mm. and people that have um, uh, planned their, um, their t time off at work uh, over flying from Australia to New Zealand for the event. It's, it happens quite often. How do you manage to publicize this without losing perspective of who you want to be able to come? You don't want people turning up in street clothes. How do you promote it in order to gain the elements that you want? A combination of website, 
artwork on the poster, flyers, um, word of mouth, uh, reputation, um, any media that um, publishes anything. Uh, I, you know, I basically say to them that you know if you if you, know, if you want to do an article or something on the ball, then it'd be nice if you could put this across for me. So it's a combination of, of everything, really. The poster, if someone took the poster and took everything off it, all the text, all the, the design, everything else, and we just left the, the original image, it probably wouldn't be allowed on the street. But. <laughs> <laughs> How have venues responded to you when you've wanted to rent the space? Uh, and uh, Once I was established, uh, say three, two, three years after the first one, um, I would have the, I could choose I could pick and choose any venue in Christchurch. Oh wow! And um, and so going going from 120 people um, to the peak, which would have been up around uh, I think the 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 for about five years running before the earthquakes, I was getting about a thousand people through the door. So oh, cool. um, there were only there were only two two venues in Christchurch that. Um, were licensed for 900 to 1,000 people that had the decor and, and the um, and the the fit out the, the, uh, um, everything that would that I could make work for the night. There were other venues, but they were either too sterile or conference like, or would take too much effort to, to um, dress up. So um, ministry nightclub was uh, the one, uh, probably the best of the lot, um, and then the Civic, which was a, a, a historic building on one of Christchurch's main streets, Manchester Street, um, a beautiful facade, um, grandiose pillars and main entrance and steps uh, uh, walking up and then balconies. It was like a, um, uh, a neo-Gothic um uh, it was a beautiful building, but that's gone, unfortunately. I'm wondering how race comes into this, because all over the world, we hear a lot of different things about people of different races in the fetish community. And sometimes there's a lot of acceptance. Sometimes there isn't. How is that seen in New Zealand? Um, I don't know if race comes into it over here. Uh, okay. We're a multicultural society in New Zealand, um, although predominantly white Anglo-Saxon um, European descent, um, and with the other uh, higher proportion being uh, Maori, which is uh, New Zealand indigenous um, people. Um, I, I, yeah, I don't think um, there's any. Uh, there are any um, what would you call it prejudices or okay. um, or preferences. Uh, I think everyone just gets along. Okay. Why are you choosing not to do it this year? When you put so much in for so long, and you are committed to an event happening regardless of what's going on with the outside world. Um, you have to make it work, and with COVID lurking in the background, you know we could be in lock. We could go into lockdown. I must refund everybody who's bought tickets. Yeah. Um, I've, got, I've got to make it work. So, um, you know, like in the early days, I've, I've used different methods of promoting the ball over, over the years. In the early days, um, I would have you know, five thousand flyers printed, and and then um, sort of four weeks before the event. Uh, I'd head, head off into Central Christchurch with four people. The whole central city zigzagging every every street, every side street, every car that was parked in the central city um, for, for that night, being a Friday or a Saturday, would put a flyer under the windscreen wiper. So we get rid of two to three thousand flyers in a night. How long does the ball last? I mentioned earlier that. We, I used to open the doors at 11 and we'd go through to 5 or 6 in the morning. Um, but with the, the, the council now um, having a whole different set of rules for, um, for drinking and socialising um, out in public, um, most nightclubs generally need to close at around between 2 and 3 o'clock 
Oh. So um, I open the doors early now. I open the doors at nine, oh. and um, it's normally uh, busy by ten, um, peaking at about sort of midnight to one, uh, and then kind of petering out around two thirty, um, and then closing up at three. Everyone out of, out of the venue by three. It's a shame because um, things start to get really funky at about five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> um, it, it, the whole, everything changes once the um, <clears throat> once the fly-by-nighters have uh, left. Sounds like uh, you don't have the same lockout laws that Australia mm. suffers. Um, I don't know. Of, um, I'm not, I've, I've heard that they've got some rules and regulations that haven't gone down too well with the public. Um, but I don't know exactly what they are, whether or not you, you leave one club, you're not allowed to go back in. Or, um, yeah, like, yeah. It doesn't sound like you've got that problem, which is good to hear. Uh, I think at one point they did try and um, implement something like that, but I don't know. I, I couldn't comment. Um, I'm not. I'm not a regular in, in the city nightlife anymore. Um, Living in the country, and uh, really the only thing I do in the city um, is the ball. Now, what is the best thing you've ever seen at the? Uh, Fetish ball, and what is the worst thing that you've seen at the fetish ball? I mean, I've had some, some some of the performers have just been stunning, absolutely stunning. Um, uh, if you get a chance, um, have a look at uh, Satomi's website. Um, should still, I think, be um, TokyoLoveDoll.com. Um, she's an amazing performer. I mean, she's she's dainty, um, very heavily tattooed, um, stunningly beautiful, uh, and could tie someone three times her weight and, and suspend them, you know, using her fingertips. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, amazing, yeah. Oh, okay. um, you know, she's done a couple of solo performances that I would say would be um, among um, some of my highlights. What's the worst thing you've seen at the Fetish Ball? People... Uh, if someone's going to the ball and it's their first time and they're not sure and they've made an effort to get dressed up, um, no matter how much they want to do something <clears throat> they're not allowed to do, being untoward or um, you know, breaking the rules or whatever, uh, they don't because people don't want to get kicked out. Uh, you know, that They're in there, they're having a the time of their lives, they're seeing things that they've never seen before. Um, not many people will be so stupid as to, um, to, to break a rule and, and, and be thrown out. So we've been lucky in that respect. Um, the worst thing, um, I can't think of any. Um, we've got the the, uh, the usual characters, the usual perverts that turn up. Um, uh, one guy that um, we call him the perpetual masturbator, he just, just likes um, sitting in the corner watching um, and, uh, and doing what he does. But... Um, he doesn't. He doesn't bother anyone. No one. No one bothers him. Um, he's just like almost like part of the furniture now. Um, uh, mm, I can't think of anything that stands out as being bad enough to call it one of the worst. Now, you're taking a break this year. Mm -hmm. Where do you hope to see the fetish ball in the next five years? Maybe. Uh, probably the same place it was five years ago. Um, just continuing on uh, current tra trajectory. Uh, we'd, I mean, I, I, I doubt if we'll ever get a thousand people through the door again. Um, Why not? Like we did. Um, the, the nightlife, the nightlife in Christchurch is, is just not. Um, I don't know whether it's the economy or the. Um, all the uh, council bylaws and rules and regulations on on uh, drinking on the street, or um, whether it's people have matured, or whether it's uh, I don't know what it is. I can't I can't pinpoint it, but um, mm -hmm. um, the nightlife, the scene in, in Christchurch uh, has just changed. Now, do you think taking a break this year will impact future? participation uh, I don't think so I don't think in a negative way anyway I think um, 
I mean, I've, I've had people contact me. I get people contact me every week asking um, if I'm doing one this year and where it is and when it is and uh, the details. Okay. Um, so it's a, there are definitely people that are looking forward to it. Um, and I've just got, I've just I said to them, look, I'm, I need some time off. Um, we we'll back bigger and better next year. And, and they, they're looking forward to it. So it'll just, uh, for me, it'll just, um, it'll be uh, put more effort in it, start a promotion, get the people back that may have drifted and um, and then continue working to get new ones into the scene. I've been asked by a little birdie to ask you to explain for us what sweet as bro means. <laughs> um, oh, I think it's a Kiwi term. Um, Aussies probably... Uh, know what we're talking about um, as well, but um, uh, I mean, sweet means great, and good. Um, you don't use that word in in the states or anywhere over that way. Um, sweet, we cool, do, great. but I think the, the connotations are probably a bit different. Right, um, a bro is like brother, short for brother. You know, it's like um, sweet, sweet as bro is like good as gold, mate. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, sweet as bro could uh, say it another way could be good as gold, mate. Oh, okay, okay. So, I would like to thank you, Glenn, very, very much for joining Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. You're the first person I've been able to include from New Zealand, and I'm very grateful. 